Hello. Uh, I'm Claire Le Deyer. This is my garden. It's starting to rain, but we'll do the best we can and we'll see if we can get it all in one video. If not, we'll try to. So, uh, I have compiled a list of the herbs in this garden and I've referenced Culpepper's Complete Herbal, uh, some vegetable gardening in the Colonial Williamsburg way, herbs for the medieval household for cooking, healing, and diverse arts, and a more modern book, Drive by Dog. Uh, I want to stress that anything mentioned in this lecture is purely historical and should not be taken as medical advice. So first on the list, we've got rosemary, one of the best loved and most useful herbs. It's used in recipes for salads, fish sauces, wine flavorings, and at Christmas along with the bay to deck the boar's head in bay and rosemary. It was used as a scent for hand washing water and in chests against pests to keep your clothes nice and unholy. Uh, it is still used today in food, soaps, and perfumes. This is a curry plant. Uh, I want to stress this is not THE curry plant, apparently. Uh, that is a common misconception. The actual curry powder that you would get at the store is a blend of spices and contains things from the curry tree, which is an entirely different family. But it is used as a spice and it does smell like curry and it's quite nice. It has insecticidal properties and is good as an essential oil to augment flavor of fruit flavored treats and fragrances. Uh, this is the sage. It's one of the must have on any medieval list of herbs grown for pottages and salads and of course flavored in meat. I myself cooked it up in, in goose with apple and onion uh, for Thanksgiving last year. It's quite nice. The steam from the boiling water, along with other herbs, could be breathed as a cure for toothaches. It's considered good for general health and could quiet the shaking of the palsy and improve digestion, as well as itching, depending on how you took it. It is the first among the seasonings today, good with pork, fish, and poultry stuffings. This is Sicilian oregano. It's just a smaller variety than some others on the market today. Uh, I've got a pretty small yard, so we're keeping the container pots occasionally. It's used in many food dishes as well as sachets. And I didn't actually find any medicinal uses in my books because they're English in nature and this is a hot Mediterranean plant. So they wouldn't have known about it or been able to grow it. This of course, y'all recognize as strawberry. And I believe, let's see if we can find a label here. Ha, <laughs> in a joke, it's the kind that's known as eclair. That's funny. Uh, there's also some sequoia in there. Banks Herbal states it is good for bleary eyes, and the great herbal said it was especially good against the evils of the spleen. It is also said to comfort the stomach and quench thirst. Hortus sanditatus gives a really weird and gross recipe that involves dog poop uh, that would cure throat ulcers. I think I'll be more interested in the strawberry water that was good for people who sweat too much. Modern herbalists will take the leaf as a tea and use the, the fruit to remove teeth stains and whiten the skin. This is a more uncommon plant. This is Morris alba pendula. It is a white mulberry in a columnar form. I'm growing it with the hopes of uh, eventually feeding silkworms and spinning my own silk for Kingdom Arts and Sciences project. The dried fruits are said to cure fluxes and an excess of womanly courses. That's your period, y'all. The bark of the fruit was used against worms of the body. The juice of the berry was good against throat inflammation and soreness and is a remedy against serpent bites. Serpent bites come up a lot in this list. The leaves can be beaten with vinegar and applied to burns, and then a decoction of the bark and leaves, good against mouth and toothaches. The leaves are also good to stop the bleeding of wounds, the mouth, the nose, or piles. I have a lot of containers on this side of the yard because this is the dog yard and he likes to eat things. So here I've got my succulents because they're pretty and they're good in summer and they don't take a lot of water, which is also good for summer. Here's some thyme. Uh, on the left we've got lime, lemon thyme and on the right is lime thyme. So if I can zoom in a little, this has got a bit of a yellow bordering on the leaves that the other one lacks. It's generally grown in gardens for pottages and meat flavoring. It's good with honey for driving out phlegm, for asthma, and expelling worms. If you cook it with wine, it will warm the heart, the liver, and the spleen. It is more popular now as a flavoring than in the Middle Ages, used with stuffing, soup, sauces, and meatloaf. This one is known as motherwort. 
Wart is an old English word for plant. It's spelled W-O-R-T. So, you know, mother plant. And therefore, of course, used as a remedy for female reproductive orders, disorders. For instance, it's purported to help regulate menstrual periods, especially when someone is anxious or tense. And we might all need that in a couple months. It is said to make women joyful mothers of children and settle their wombs as they should be, cleansing the chest of cold phlegm and killing worms in the belly. It's of good use to warm and dry up the cold, wet humors and help against all the symptoms thereof, like pains in the joints, cramps, convulsions. These are chives. You've probably had them on a salad or on a baked potato because they taste pretty similar to onions, but a lot smaller. They are the same genus. They are thought to send hurtful vapors to the brain, though causing trouble sleeping and spoiling eyesight, so they really weren't used a lot in the, medi the medieval times. If you could find an alchemist, he could prepare it chemically so that it would use, use as a remedy to stop urine. Over here we've got uh, French tarragon. It doesn't really pop up in English herbals. The climate just might not be so great. Uh, in Spain, the tender tops were cooked with vegetables and the juice was used to flavor drinks. It sweetened the breath and dulled the taste of better medicines as well as aided in sleep. It's used more widely today in salads and sauces. Tarragon vinegar is considered by many as an essential in French dressing. This is Roman chamomile. There are two types. I apparently have the slightly less useful one, but it, if drunk with wine, it will break up the stones and destroy the evil, the yellow evil and health liver ailments. It's good for headaches and migraines. You can boil it with orange peel as a hand wash. It is not said to have medicinal uses today, but French housewives still prefer it for weak stomachs, headaches, and pale complexions. You can find it in sleep aid teas and shampoos. This one's just barely starting to leaf out, but this is a dwarf variety of germander. It is said to strengthen the brain and thinking abilities and relieve them when drooping. If you take it with honey, it will be a remedy for coughs, hardness of the spleen, and difficulty of urine, as well as helping those with dropsy. I'm not entirely sure what dropsy is. You might want to ask Seamus. It can bring on women's courses and expel a dead, the dead child. AKA, don't try that at home, please. Most effective against the poison of all serpents, first when drank with wine, and then when bruised and applied to the wounds. You can use it with honey to clean old ulcers. It's also good for side pains and cramps, headaches, and all diseases of the brain. Now here's one Eleanor would recognize. I got this from her last April. It's Alexander's. It's, it's honestly still not doing so hot. Two of those leaves are yellow. I think it used to be in a bigger pot, honestly. Maybe she could tell. It warms a cold stomach and promotes general flow of urine, periods, expelling of afterbirth, passing of gas, etc. It opens a stoppage of the liver and spleen and can be boiled or bruised in wine to help against snake bites. It is recommended to have it regularly in a pottage. Hello, Alan. Hello, how are you? Yeah? Snoofle, snoofle. Anyway, there's your dog break. He likes to pretend to help me garden by eating it. Hence the fence. So, here is Angelica. The stalks and the roots when candied and eaten alone are good against infection and to warm a cold stomach. You can steep it in vinegar or distill it in wine to ease the pains and torments of the cold and wind. It can be taken as a powder to help against ailments of the lung and breath, such as coughs and shortness of breath. It helps against pain of colic, the stoppage of urine, and aids in the starting of courses and the expelling of afterbirth and the opening of the liver and spleen. A decoction drunk before the fit of an... I don't know how to pronounce the word A-G-U-E. I've always sort of been like... Oog will help with the aid sweating before the fit. The garden variety is more useful than the wild variety, but both can be used. Pardon me while I flip a page here. This is the golden variety of marjoram, and it is a must for every medieval garden. According to Cresetius, it has a noble taste, used to flavor soups, meat dishes, omelets, pickles, and salads. It can be found in French recipes for hippocras. Sweet varieties are used for hand washing before meals, which by the way, they did a lot in the medieval time. The herbs could be used for colds, stomach aches, and indigestion, depending on how it's applied. Oil distilled from the plant was important in certain perfumes. This is lamb's ear, uh, and it's not in any of the books I own because it is native to Turkey, Armenia, and Ar Iran. It is useful as in field dressing because it's antiseptic, anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, and super absorbent. 
I can also be used as a poultice, either alone or to help hold in other herbs like comfrey. It was often used in the aftermath of bees and wasp stings and reduced the swelling from both. Here's some betony. It's a popular remedy for many ills in the Middle Ages, said to be good against nightmares and night terrors. Banks herbal said that it could be, quote, stamped and then laid to a wound in the head and it will heal the wound fair. It's good for all ailments of the head, in fact, watery eyes, aching ears, nosebleeds, toothaches and coughs. None of these are verified, but it is still used, well, it still was used at least for headaches, dyspepsia and hysteria and smoked in place of tobacco at least into the 1940s because that's when that old herbal book I've got is from. So now we're going to go and enter into the dog forbidden area. Got this nice, clever little gate I built. He's got, got four foot chicken wire fence and the hopes that he doesn't come and eat everything. This is sweet woodruff. Uh, there's a different variety known as bed straw, but it's a lot softer, stickier, doesn't have his glossy leaves. It's got nice leaf arrangements of six in a whirl there. It smells like newly mown hay when dried and was used on floors, garlands, and to perfume the clothing in the chests for storage. It was good for healing all sicknesses that come from heat, according to Hortus sanitatus, and, and used against moths. This is where my mint lives because we all know how mint goes and it spreads. And I don't really know what varieties are in here. I think on the left side with those really dark stems, we have chocolate mint. Let's take a sniff. Nope, that's all lemon balm. But that one might be a little different. Maybe it is just lemon balm. It does like to take over. Uh, be that as it may, there is definitely mint in this pot. This is mojito mint. Yay. A 9th century writer was quoted as saying, There is as many varieties of mint as there are sparks from Vulcan's furnace. And there are countless recipes. You can use it to rub on teeth for a sweet smelling mouth and poultices for botches on the faith, to apply to toothaches and to prevent vomiting, and to inhibit internal worms. They use it a lot in a lot of things today. This is lemon balm. It's one of my favorites, which is a good thing that it spreads then, I guess. I've always liked lemon balm. Dioscorides said that the leaves could be applied and drunk with wine against the bites of dogs and scorpions and could lessen the pain of gout. Dried leaves against the head could dry congestion. Leaves eaten with salt could relieve difficulty in breathing and clear the chest. It is still used in Europe as a home remedy for fainting, dizziness, wounds, neuralgia, and feverish colds. Dried leaves add flavors to soup and sausages, and fresh leaves are good in wine beverages. And like, as I said, if you just sort of rub it a little, smell it, there's a lemon scent. That's how you know. Down here, We've got some catnip. Y'all probably know what this looks like in its dried form. Medicinally, it is used to treat intestinal cramps for digestion and to cause sweating, to induce menstruation as a sedative and to increase appetite. And of course, as its name implies, cats love it. This little plant here is a not so well-known fruit in our garden, but it's very popular in England. This is gooseberry. And my particular gooseberry plant is kind of on probation because it has never flowered for me and somehow last year I got one single fruit. So we'll see what it does this year. The fruit is frequently preserved in sugar and good to stay, quote, the longings of women with child, which to me sounds like food cravings. A de decoction of the leaves cools hot swelling and inflammation. The ripe berries can be eaten and is an excellent remedy against the violent heat of both the stomach and the liver. The young and tender leaves break up both kidney and gallstones. Uh, and you can see it's just starting to leaf out. It's kind of got a geranium shape to the leaf when it's out. There's some down there that are already out. I've got a maidenhair fern right here. It's Ferns in general are good for thatch, winter garden insulation. Might have used it for some animal feed. Uh, maidenhairs are used medicinally in Iranian medicine, but it's not this the species. Here we've got a bunch of pea plants that I started, probably too early, but in this day and age, what do you expect? I mean, I probably know the nursery's closed by now. 
peas have a very these have a are the variety organ sugar pod and they have a very long picking season they're crisp and sweet and stay tender and fresher longer than other varieties they can be cooked but i prefer to eat them fresh pods and all i've got a couple of conifers here that's a day uh deodar cedar and i don't actually remember what this one is so if anybody has any idea please let me know it's probably about four years old now it's they're both dwarf varieties that one really isn't put on any growth, but at least it's not dead. Up here, we've got a really interesting vine growing. And before I noticed, it had gone all the way up my neighbor's birch tree. I took that part down. This is passion flower. Here's what the flowers look like. That is actually one from my garden, taken last year. And that is a fruit, which I have not had yet, because it's kind of weird. So this looks like a fancy ass tropical plant. You would be wrong. It actually grows in the American Southwest and was for thousands a year a main staple food of the Cherokee who called like and, and, is, and they refer to those areas as maypop. Uh, it's hardy to zone five and if the winter is mild the vine won't die back. Mine has not actually ever grown died back in the couple years I've had it. It's pollinated by insects such as bumblebees and carpenter bees and it's self sterile which means I'm not gonna get fruit with just one plant I have to get a second plant the flowers are only out for a day and then the fruit comes two to three months later <clears throat> uh, today we like to use it as a culinary flavoring in fact passion fruit comes from passion flower obviously it is almost considered an agricultural weed and it is the Tennessee state flower historically it is used as an herbal medicine in the belief that it treats anxiety, insomnia, and hypertension. So like any lovely gardener, uh, I've got several, several roses here. This one is an heirloom tea rose, literally referred to as the variety heirloom. Over here we've got Climbing Don Juan. And those are on, I think their second or third year of growth, they, they took a, a little while to get to established. And I don't remember the name of this variety but it was like a climbing tea rose and it's got light pink flowers and obviously it's been here a lot longer than the rest of them. Roses are referred to as the flower of flowers and are used for hand washing, dried and added to ch clothing chests to prevent, of course, against bugs and to keep things smelling nice. It's popular as rose water flavoring in desserts, especially marzipan, and can be mixed as a syrup with honey for feeble, sick, phlegmatic, melancholy, and choleric people, according to Banks Herbal. It's also good in face ointments for blemishes. I actually have it in toner upstairs. Dry roses put to the nose to smell are a good comfort for the brain and heart and cheer the spirit. You can now find it in perfumes, lotions, sachets, and the like. And it's still used as a flavoring for food and drink in the Near East. I think that's everything on that side. Over here, we've got another of my favorite plants which is just starting to leaf out, thank God, because I did very aggressive pruning to it in the mulberry. This is a medlar. Uh, this is a, a fruit you're not gonna really find at the grocery store today because it has to rot or blet in order to be eaten. In fact, I picked it in October, and I don't think it was till December or January when I could actually process the fruits that I put in my fridge. And I checked them pretty much every day because last year I didn't, they were in the garage and they got all shriveled. So that was kind of annoying. Uh, in fact, Shakespeare refers to things as being rotten as a medlar. Uh, but the advantage of that is when all the other fruits have been gone off or been eaten, that's a fruit you can eat in late winter. You can make a placer from the fruit before it has rotted and apply it to stop miscarriages and bloody fluxes. The leaves are good for this and is a decoction against pain, swelling, and bleeding of the tooth and mouth. It is good in a bath for those with heavy courses or bleeding piles. They clearly had a lot of problems with piles and worms back then. It's good as a pol in a poultice with roses, cloves, nutmeg, and coral, and applied to the stomach that loathes meat. Dry leaves and powder help restrain blood and heal wounds. And when drank with wine, it can help against kidney stones. Under my medlar, I have transplanted these little babies here, which don't look very impressive now, but if you saw the flower, you'd know it in a heartbeat. It's saffron! It only has those three little red things that we get the spice from. 
And in fact, it is so, was so popular that one third of the recipes for medieval well-to-do houses contained saffron. That's the distinctive flavor, as well as that golden yellow color that, you know, you expect a saffron rice. Supposedly, Henry VIII was so fond of it that he forbade court ladies from using it as a hair dye. Only the stigmas are used, like I said, and about, it takes about 75,000 flowers to produce a pound of saffron spice. This is supposed to be my hearty hibiscus. The flowers on it last year looked like that. Uh, I'm not entirely sure this one survived the winter. It was supposed to, but they don't start coming up until April, so we'll see. It could be that the whole main sort of rootstock is just dead and needs to come back from the bulb. I don't really know how it works. There are very many species found in tropical places around the world, and not quite so tropical places, uh, with so many uses that I won't list them here. I bought it because I like Hawaii a lot, and it was pretty. And I was excited by having a tropical plant. Ah, is there a variety label on this? There is. Look at that. Summer in Paradise. That's a nice name. So that's what it's supposed to look like. Okay. Over here we've got my carrot starts. Uh, these are not hardy in our climate, but they're grown as an annual. They're rich in vitamin A, B, and K, as well as potassium and folate. This particular variety, which is known as the Little Finger, haha, Game of Thrones fans, uh, not that Little Finger, uh, is great for small containers. Um, and my dog is very fond of eating the tops, so he'll enjoy that. We've got some more strawberry starts over here. This was in question a few days ago, but I'm pretty sure this is Lovage. It opens cure cures and digests the humors and provokes urine and women's courses. It cleanses and heals ulcers and sores and lessens their inflammation. When gargled warm in the mouth, it cures Quincy or King's evil in the throat. Again, I have no idea, so go ask Seamus. He probably knows. The same water when applied to the skin takes away spots, marks, and scabs. Might have to try it for my eczema later. A little when drank quenches extraordinary thirst. Also got a really nice stepping stone here. Just take a look at that. And he's turned off for now, but that's Claude with his little fake fishies. Because there used to be fake water lilies as well until the dog ate them. Over here we've got my lettuce starts. Again, it's pretty early. You really shouldn't put them out this early, but I didn't have anywhere else to put them in there. We might not be able to buy such things soon. These can be picked throughout their growth. You just pinch off the outside leaves and leave the base intact. It's better to actually pick them, keep picking them throughout the season when the leaves are young, otherwise they get tough and bitter. And it's a nice tall pot. This is dill, and it should get as long as these steaks. Banks Herbal says it's good medicinally to ease stomach rumblings and wicked winds, as well as a hiccup cure. The seeds when burnt were used to help wounds cure faster. It is best known today, of course, for flavoring pickles, but it's also good with boiled cabbage and turnips and cauliflower. Back here we have wormwood. It's a, you'll know it best probably as the ingredient, one of the ingredients in the spirit known as absinthe, but you can use it in, as flavorings in other spirits and wines like bitters and vermouth. Can you sec for that motorcycle to go away? Okay. Culpepper has a thing for wormwood. He rambles on and on about it, but not actually in a useful way, saying, wormwood I shall, common wormwood I shall not describe, for every body that can eat an egg knows of it, which to me kind of means that it might have a sort of sulfur taste. And in fact, they do reference it a lot in the Bible, sort of is in Revelation about things smelling of like brimstone and wormwood and like the end times and anyway. Uh, it is, the Roman wormwood is known to help with stinking breath. And as medicine, it is used today to counteract poor appetite and impair digestion for various infectious diseases like Crohn's disease and IgA neuropathy, which is a disease of the kidneys and immune system. This plant, I bet, will probably be pretty useful pretty soon. This is whorehound. And when taken with honey, it is a remedy for those who are short-winded, have a cough or a consumption, which I think was tuberculosis. Again, I don't really study medicine, so I have no idea. Or I forgot. You could look that up. Uh, this helps expectorate phlegm. It is given with to women to bring on the courses, expel the afterbirth, and is in a treatment against venomous bites or stings. See, they're really worried about those venomous bites and stings. But in a time when you didn't have anti-venom, you take what you could get. 
When used with honey, it can purge foul ulcers and sores and the creeping of the flesh over the nails, which to me sounds exactly like an ingrown toenail. It helps with the pain to the side and can clear eyes and nostrils when mixed with honey and wine. You can mix it with a little rose oil and drop it into the ears to ease pain. Now over here, I had a much bigger one, but it really took over the garden, so I replaced it with a small one this year again. Uh, this is rue. Rue is bitter, but was used in the Middle Ages as a seasoning for salads, herb omelets, and fish sauces. I think that's useful because black pepper doesn't, which is a much later thing, and even long pepper, I think they're both exported. Imported. Imported. So if you can get something that is local, that you don't have to pay for, that spices your food, all the better. It appears among herbs for the cup, which I think means copper, so it was likely also used to flavor wines and beers. It is considered valuable as an antidote to ward off disease, insects, witches, and all manner of evil things. It could be used against lethargy, headaches, snake bites, and the feebleness of sight. Country people would put it in their beds to get rid of bugs and hung sprigs off to ward off flies. This is that mystery plant that I posted on the, the gardening group. The Google wants to show me all kinds of different leaf arrangements when I look up valerian. Some of them do look like this. And in fact, here there are exactly opposite leaves. But in other cases, like this one, I'm getting almost slightly alternate leaves. If you look at the bottom, they do have a basal arrangement. So I think valerian, but we're just going to have to wait until see when it flowers. Here is my English lavender. It is highly prized. It's not doing so great, by the way. I did recently repot it in a sandier soil because I heard it likes poor drainage, so we'll see how that helps. It's highly prized as an herb for perfuming silks and linens of the wealthy and strewn in chests to prevent insects. It was believed a sprinkling of lavender water would preserve chastity. I think we're a little late for that in this house. Uh, it is recommended in the Hortus sanitatus as headaches in a little bag, along with bay, betony, red roses, marjoram, cloves, and nutmeg blossoms. They recommended different bags for the nobility and the common folk. Like It was like a red silk bag for the nobility and linen or whatever you had for the commons. It was also said to work against apoplexy and palsy and loss of speech. Today, of course, you can find it in soaps, perfume, and sachets. In our last pot here, which, oh, I'd say stands about a four and a half foot tall at this point, is a bay laurel. It is good for flavoring soups and jellies and wines in the Middle Ages and laid among clothes because it smelled nice. It was said to be good to purge a man of the phlegm and cholera, according to Banks Herbal, and to cure colic, according to the Great Herbal. And I'll be honest, the only reason I've got this growing is if someday I ever get offered to be a laurel, I will sew all the leaves together and say that I made my own laurel wreath. That's it. It's the only reason I... Okay, and it smells nice, but that's the reason I bought it anyway. So we'll go back out of this lovely place. There's where we started. My lovely juice. Uh, I do have some seed starts to grow some more things, and I've got some dirt there for that. Maybe that'll be a future video. Oh, yes, yeah, so we mustn't forget our neighbor's uh, lovely conifer that likes to take over our yard. We used to have a similar tree and decided to take it out. And for you foodies, there's my Traeger. Here's a nice view of what the fenced area looks like. So that's my garden. Hope you all enjoyed the tour. Bye.